topics that are addressed be dealt with in a very constructive way. We think it's a whole lot better to shed light than to create heat. One is easier, the other is tougher. I think we're all up for the tough task of creating light. And as we move into the rest part of the day, I want to just make sure everybody here in the hall and those of us uh, who are joining virtually know what the procedure is going to be for the uh, moderated question and answer period. For those in the hall, there will be ushers moving around and uh, asking for your cards. Please, if you feel free, put your name on the card, at least your first name, so we can feel like it really is coming from a real person. And for those of you who are on Google Plus and joining us with the live chat there, if you would also be willing to identify where you are uh, asking your question from, and if you're comfortable in listing your first name, that would be helpful to us as well. So we have a golden opportunity uh, now to proceed, and with that, I'm going to ask a Peace Scholar to come to the podium to introduce this next session. Kate Anderson is a senior at Luther College. She is double majoring in French and history, and she will be kicking off this session with an introduction. Kate. On behalf of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum and its tradition of inspiring peacemaking, it is my honor to introduce Mr. Stephen B. Young. As Global Executive Director of the Co Roundtable since 2000, Mr. Young has enriched and deepened the organization's commitment to an economically viable and moral approach to free market capitalism. In his book, Moral Capitalism, he integrates the theory of Adam Smith and other moral philosophies. His dedication to discussing business ethics with some of the most influential leaders and executives in the world sets him apart. After obtaining his Juris Doctorate from Harvard Law School, Mr. Young spent several formative years in Vietnam. Along with working alongside groups like the Tan Dai Viet Party, Mr. Young helped thousands upon thousands of refugees escape violence and repression in Cambodia, South Vietnam, and Laos. Since that time, Mr. Young has served as Dean of Hamlin Law School, as well as Assistant Dean at Harvard Law School, where he authored a study of traditional Chinese and Vietnamese human rights values and practices. He also co-founded the Center for American Experiment in 1992. The keynote address you are about to hear is a bit different in structure from the others. However, open discussion constitutes one of the most important parts of making steps towards peace. As we have all pushed ourselves this weekend to explore what we could do to make peace, Mr. Young shows us that even in discussing a difficult issue and moving forward with a promise of ethics, we can change our world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Stephen Young to the podium. Thank, thank you, Caitlin. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to suggest before I introduce our, our distinguished speakers, a proposition that if you don't get peace right, you get war. And I would like to draw our attention to, to our world at this present time. I would argue that the acts of Russia just recently in seizing the Crimea from Ukraine constitutes an act of war. Ukraine is within its rights to declare war against Russia. I would like to have you also recall a hundred years ago, a few months hence, in August 1914, when another act of violence took place in Sarajevo, which led to the declaration of war, a war that nobody intended, nobody wanted, and yet happened, World War I, which was not only massively destructive in its own terms, it perhaps there's a new book that's out there, I think, that argues it set forth the bloody history of the 20th century. The way the war ended set up the situation in Germany, which led to the rise of Hitler. The war set up the collapse of various empires, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire. Collapse of the Russian Empire led to the rise of Lenin and communism. 
collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire led to destabilization in Eastern Europe, which is only ending in our time, down to Kosovo. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire set up the division of lands in the Middle East, which are today at war, Sunni, Shia, and Iraq, and the self-destruction of Syria. Ladies and gentlemen, the question for us then is if we do not have peace, what do we have? We have an institution, the Nobel Peace Prize Institution, which is directed by Dr. Lundstad, whose bio is in your book, um, which has a particular charter to bring peace to our attention. And he will have some comments. The format will be, he will speak for 10 minutes. Jay Nordinger is going to follow for 10 minutes. Then we will have two rebuttals. Dr. Lundstad for another 10 minutes, Jay Nordinger for another 10 minutes. Then we will open up to questions and answers. Jay Nordlinger, as you know from this, is the senior editor of the National Review. And may I comment that the National Review, like the Nobel Peace Prize Institute, is an institution that's dedicated to ideas, to ideals. And the National Review, since its founding, Jay, in 1954? Five. Five, 1955, by William Buckley, has made a mark on American history. So ladies and gentlemen, we are very privileged to have representatives of these two most important institutions with us today. Dr. Lindegar. Thank you for the introduction. It's great to be here. This is the 26th Nobel Peace Prize Forum. I guess I have been to about 20 of these 26. So uh, many of you have met me before. And you may have heard some of my comments about the Nobel Peace Prize before. Uh, in my introduction, I am to uh, show off my entirely civilized side. And then in my rebuttal, I'm very much looking forward to commenting on the, Mr. Norling's points. Uh, but we actually agree on some points. And I want to emphasize some of these points here. Whenever I speak about the Nobel Peace Prize, I refer to the Oxford Dictionary of Contemporary History. If you look in that dictionary under Nobel Peace Prize, it will say the world's most prestigious prize. Those are not my words. Those are the words of the Oxford Dictionary. I like them. I quote them at, on every occasion I have, so I see no reason to make an exception for you people. If you look at, look at Mr. Nordlinger's book, he will basically agree, because the subtitle to his book is The Most Famous and Controversial Prize in the World. Thank you, Jay. This is wonderful that you have this uh, high opinion about the Nobel Peace Prize. You do discuss whether the Nobel Peace Prize or the Oscars are the most famous, but you come to the conclusion, well, I will give the Nobel Peace Prize the benefit of the doubt. I think, uh, Jay, to uh, kind of develop a theory about this, I mean, you come from the American right, but you worked very seriously uh, on uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. And you became convinced that, oh, there are many individual, worthy individuals and organizations here, because you have statements like, they are all interesting. Uh, the committee... Uh, is very earnest in its work and its approach. So you became fascinated by many of the laureates. That's fine and good. You might think there is a qualification there in the word controversial. So I'm very happy to address this because uh, I think controversy is very important to the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes, it's true that many of the prizes have been very controversial. Many of the best prizes have been very controversial. I know Americans are automatically thinking about the prize to Obama. No, 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 it doesn't make the list. This, of course, it was very controversial in America, but only 6% of the world's population live in America. We have a global approach. The prize to, no, the, uh, the reaction to the prize to Obama was largely favorable in Europe, 
in Africa, in many parts of the world. We have 15,000 people showing up in Oslo for the torchlight procession to honor Obama. We have never, ever had any such response, at least in the 25 years I've been working with the Nobel Peace Prize. This was a popular prize in many parts of the world. I'm happy to discuss the details of all this, but it doesn't make the list as far as controversial, really controversial prizes are concerned. But controversy is not wrong. And I will tell you why. In 1935, or the prize for 1935, was given to Karl von Ossietzky. He was the symbol of resistance against Adolf Hitler. And Hitler became furious. He issued an order that no German could ever receive any of the Nobel Prizes, and this prevented three German scientists from going to Stockholm to receive their science prizes. And this had very negative reactions uh, for the Norwegian-German relationship. Two members, two of the five members of the committee, left the committee. One was the foreign minister of Norway, and one was the previous prime minister, because they knew that Hitler would become furious. There was a huge debate in Norway and all over Europe, about this Nobel Peace Prize to Karl von Ossietzky, the symbol of resistance. But of the many who have written about the Nobel Peace Prize, virtually all, including Jay, concludes that this is maybe one of the most important prizes in our 113-year history. Then, the Nobel Committee gave the prize to Andrei Sakharov and Lech Walesa. The Nobel Committee has been very strong on the importance of democracy and human rights. There is no moral equivalence between East and West on this point. And again, the old rulers in the Kremlin became very furious. This was to be expected. There was, uh, uh, of course, uh, this was against their interests. And they told the world so. Although, as a little footnote, Khrushchev had actually been quite interested in receiving the Nobel Peace Prize. And he had approached certain committee members on this point. Of course, he was never, ever a serious candidate for the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Sakharov and Lech Walesa. And then the committee gave the prize to the Dalai Lama and Liu Xiaobo. And the not quite so old men in Beijing became furious. And they did everything they could to uh, ruin the ceremony on, uh, and to uh, reduce interest in these prizes. Uh, there was considerable hacking going on. They intervened with all the countries represented in Oslo to stay away from the ceremony. They instituted a Confucius Prize to try to take uh, some of the interest away from the Nobel Peace Prize. All these prizes, Karl von Ossietzky, Andrei Sakharov, Lech Walesa, Dalai Lama, Liu Xiaobo, extremely controversial. I mean, Obama is nothing compared to these. But they have been hugely important. The committee should stand up for certain basic principles, and it has. But the laureates are very different. They are very different. Uh, some are to the left, some are to the right. I remember when we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001, there were certain activists who wanted the 35 laureates represented there to, co to uh, present a statement to the world. And of course, these were most of them were to the left, and they had certain principles they wanted to underline very strongly. But there have been quite a few conservative laureates. And they made it quite clear that they wouldn't sign such a statement. 
And I told the activists that we cannot have a statement from this uh, Nobel uh, symposium where uh, 25 were for the statement and 10 were against. It would look ridiculous. So there was no statement. That, well, there was a statement praising the laureate of the year, the United Nations and, and Kofi Annan. The laureates are very different. Some are to the left, some are to the right. They share two things. A vision. They want to go to an important place. They want to reach out for this vision. And they have all shown courage in trying to reach uh, this point. Thank you. I'm looking forward to my rebuttal. I take it we will all agree that having courage on the part of vision is a good thing. Yes, indeed, Steve. Thank you. Um, a pleasure to be here. What beautiful remarks Dr. Lungestad made. I appreciated them. And I'll tell you something funny about the subtitle of my book, as he mentioned the most famous and controversial prize in the world. My subtitle was the most famous and problematic award in the world because the concept of peace is so problematic. What is peace? Who is a worthy peacemaker? Who deserves this glittering prize, the Nobel Peace Prize? But my publisher didn't like it. They thought a better, sexier word would be controversial. But I got them back in my introduction. I said, sure, I've called the Nobel Peace Prize famous and controversial, but a better word would be problematic. I don't know if they noticed, but I did. Um, Dr. Lungestad named probably the best and gutsiest awards the committee has made. The four or five or six very best, most nervy, most daring, most noble awards. He's a very good director. There are, of course, about 120 awards. Um, I'll get into some of what Dr. Lindstad said, and then he'll correct all my errors. Uh, I wanted to say that <clears throat> peace, as I have already said, is such a slippery concept and such a tricky word. And I do think it's the most abused word in all the world, probably, except for love. Love is far and away the most abused word. But this word peace, if you hear it used enough and misused, you can get kind of sick of it. Uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union. They were very, very big on peace. They were always talking about peace. They and their satellites were the peace-loving nations, you see. The West called itself the freedom-loving nations. The Soviets named their space station Mir, meaning peace or world. One of the biggest communist front groups was a World Peace Council. Probably still exists. So I grew up a little bit skeptical of this word peace. And uh, I don't think that the cause of peace is the same as the cause of pacifism. And I don't think the cause of peace is the same as the cause of disarmament. And I want, I want to talk for a second about this. I go on about this at length in my book. But I'll make some points in a kind of rat-a-tat style here, in the interest of time. And forgive the absence of elegance. There's not enough time for elegance. I'll do spoken bullet points. Um, there's a certain belief, and sometimes it has existed on the Norwegian Nobel Committee, that disarmament equals peace. Or the fewer arms you have, the more peace you'll have. The more arms you'll ha you have, the less peace you'll have. I think this is not only untrue, but at times it has been the opposite of the truth. I sometimes think that armament, that deterrence, in fact, does deter, deter war. One of the biggest figures in Nobel history is Bertha von Suttner, the countess, later the baroness. She came down a little in the world. And her big book was Lay Down Your Arms, Die Waffen Nieder, a huge hit, a pacifist novel. Laying down your arms is fine, but will the other guy? Uh, I admire an early Nobel laureate from the 19 aughts, an Italian, probably the only Italian who's won the Nobel Peace Prize, Moneta, who said, peace, peace, yes, sure, but keep your powder dry. I also admire another pacifist or semi-pacifist, Ludwig Quidde, a German, 
who said, disarmament, fine, but security first. Um, in 1947, the Nobel Committee gave the prize to two Quaker groups for their relief efforts during the war and afterward their reconstruction efforts. Fine, magnificent, honorable groups. But who did more to win the peace? Who did more to put down Nazism? These groups or General George Patton, who would never win a Nobel Peace Prize, ever. I also think some, it makes a difference who possesses these terrible arms. I don't think an arm is merely an arm. I think there's a difference between possession of these arms by liberal democracies and by totalitarian dictatorships. And I cite an example from Nobel history. 1934, Arthur Henderson, the former British Foreign Secretary, wins the award for disarmament. He's encouraging disarmament in the face of the Nazi buildup. And the Norwegian Prime Minister Movinkel says, he cites uh, one of the great texts of Norway, or one of the great authors, Holberg, uh, his play, uh, Yeppa of the Hill, and says, ah, everyone says that Yeppa drinks, but nobody asks why Yeppa drinks. Why is Germany, why is Hitler's Germany rearming? Because the democracies are. Uh, in my book, I list some of what I regard as the errors of the Norwegian Nobel Committee over these many years. Everyone has opinion about the committee. I have mine. And uh, Dr. Lundestad knows what I think. I'll say what I think, and he will rebut me. I think a major error. Uh, has been to equate disarmament with peace. And the award has gone to unilateralists, accommodationists, nuclear freezniks. I also think there has been an unreasonable trust in, an unreasonable admiration of international organizations. The UN above all, and its many agencies and personalities. Before that, the League. Before that, the IPU, the Interparliamentary Union. I don't think that these organizations have been as conducive to peace as the Nobel Committee has. Um, the EU won the award a couple of years ago. It is the belief of some that the EU has kept the peace in at least half of Europe since 1945. I think that the good old US military and NATO are more responsible for that peace. The most recent award was given to this magnificent chemical weapons group who can argue with them, this great and honorable work they're doing? But what prevents Saddam Hussein from using WMD against innocent human beings? What induces Gaddafi to give up his WMD? Those WMD now reside in Oak Ridge, Tennessee at our nuclear laboratory. What would stop the Assad dictatorship from murdering people en masse? I'm afraid nothing but force of arms. And I do believe that the award, the 2005 award to Mohammed el Baradei and the International Atomic Energy Agency was possibly the worst award in Nobel history. I think it'll look worse once Iran goes nuclear. The peacekeepers I could speak of, the UN blue helmets, I think after Bosnia and Rwanda, they would not have received that award probably. I also think that an error during the Cold War was this moral equivalence that Dr. Lundestad spoke of and denied of the belief that there was a moral equivalence between the free and democratic West and the communist and totalitarian East. Uh, he named the best awards. Uh, Soviet communism lasted a very long time, from 1917 to 1991. Uh, there were many heroes, dissidents, prisoners of conscience, freedom fighters, and so on, all around the world in the satellites. The Soviet Union was a greatly expansionist empire. And from 1917 to 1991, the Nobel Committee did award those two awards in the anti-communist struggle in 1975 to Sakharov, which is a magnificent award, and in 1983 to Walesa or Wawensa. It's very true. They said in giving the prize to Wawensa, they were doing so really to honor labor unions. Fine with me. Those were great awards, but there were many awards to apologists uh, for the Soviet Union. The award to Liu Xiaobo, like the award to Osietsky, very, very gutsy. A Norwegian journalist told me that award cost me some of my pension. Uh, because the PRC uh, withdrew some of its funds from Norway. Good for the committee. It was a very gutsy award. It took 60 years of communist China uh, for the award to go to a freedom or democracy figure, but it happened. I doubt it will ever go to a Cuban figure or group, the ladies in white, for example, 
or Oscar Bassett, who spent 12 years in the Cuban Gulag. Armando Valladares, the great political prisoner, ex-political prisoner, sometimes called the Cuban Solzhenitsyn, author of the memoir Against All Hope, said to me, if the Cuban dictatorship were right wing instead of left wing, we would have won two or three Nobel Prizes already. I think that may be true, and I think the award to such a figure would rock that dictatorship. It's a small place, unlike China. I'm afraid that the award to Liu Xiaobo, glorious as it is, probably hasn't made a dent, hasn't even gotten his wife out of house arrest, but it's a noble, noble thing. Cuba is a Caribbean island. I believe the Nobel Peace Prize to a Cuban, a human rights figure, a democracy figure, a liberalizer would do wonders. I may be wrong. I also think the Nobel Committee from time to time has succumbed to the trendy. You know, it's the 500th anniversary of what we used to call Columbus's discovery of America. Let's give to Rigoberta Menchu, a peasant revolutionary, a supporter of this guerrilla movement. Now, remember, there's a lot to admire about Menchu. Uh, but the committee thought that maybe Gandhi wasn't a pure enough pacifist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I would say beware of wishful thinking too. Frank Kellogg was from the Twin Cities here. Coolidge's Secretary of State won the Nobel Peace Prize for the kellogg briand Pact, which was to outlaw war. But look, the committee does the best it can every year. I really do have sympathy with the committee. It doesn't sound like it now. I'm using my time for criticisms. I have much that is positive to say. I do think the committee should watch uh, an overstretching, let's say, of the definition of peace, where everything becomes peace, uh, micro-lending, tree planting, global warming campaigning, and so on. I'm loose about this. I'm sort of loosey-goosey when it comes to the interpretation of Alfred Nobel's will. But I also think it can be a little bit overstretched. And the lodestar uh, should be, as Nobel puts it in his will, uh, fraternity between nations, in my view. Shall I take 30 more seconds, Steve? Am I, am I way over? I, I, Let me, my fair, idea... Fair, fair, a basic rule for peace, Jay, is equality and fairness, right? How much more time do I have? To? I think we, we, we just ran out, so I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I'll have more to say later. And so indeed, on, that, on that abrupt and inelegant note, uh, thank you. And Dr. Lundestad will now set me straight. Thank you very much, Jay. Ladies and gentlemen, may I comment before giving the floor back to Dr. Lutterstad that our two speakers have put before you some of the most difficult and some of the most profound issues, which I would say I mean, our kind has been wrestling since the beginning. From whence cometh peace? Is it, is it the kind of, of moral character and virtue that Dr. Lutterstad was mentioning? Or are we such that from time to time more dark and negative powers are needed in order to keep us restrained from yielding to the dark side of the force, as the Star Wars movies used to talk about? Dr. Lundestad, a, a point has been made by Jay that your committee has not sufficiently recognized the dark side. You have 10 minutes to respond. I was born and raised way inside the Arctic Circle. We speak very bluntly. Uh, many in the uh, south of Norway, they consider us only a kind of semi-civilized, so that's why I like the rebuttal time much better. Uh, you, have, you, have sh you have seen my civilized side. This is what I have to present to the world on most occasions, but I like rebuttals. Let me take a few of uh, Jay's points. The point about moral equivalence that the committee uh, is, uh, it sees moral equivalence between East and West. No, no, no. I don't understand this point at all. We have given the prize to four American presidents. We have given the prize to many U.S. secretaries of state. We have given the prize to 22 Americans. Many of them fighting for human rights and democracy. We have not given the prize to a single communist who supported the communist system. Not a single one. So I mean the charge about moral equivalence 
is utterly wrong. We gave the prize to Andrei Sakharov and we gave the prize to Lech Walesa and we gave the prize to uh, Gorbachev. Nobody did more to end the communist system than these three. It is true that we have given the prize to some who criticized America. I mean, Jay is quite critical of amnesty, and he goes on rather lengthy about Nelson Mandela for criticizing America. Yes, it's true. There are men who have criticized America, because America, although it has received more Nobel Prizes than anybody else, 22, has not been perfect. There are things to criticize in America. It's true, we gave the prize to Martin Luther King. He criticized many things in America. But this is not what is important. So I reject entirely the charge of moral equivalence. Not true. Then uh, there is the point about disarmament. Uh, this is much more complicated. Alfred Nobel wrote his will that there are three criteria for those who receive the Nobel Peace Prize. One, promoting fraternity between nations. Two, reduction of standing armies. So there is a dis disarmament point in his will. And the three uh, was, point three was the holding of peace congresses. So this is a more complicated point. Um, we gave the prize last year to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. I think this was generally applauded. We all understand the importance of getting rid of chemical weapons, and we are getting close. We did give the prize uh, to, the, to the fight against landmines, but most of these disarmament prizes have been uh, for the reduction uh, of nuclear weapons. All the other disarmament prizes have been related to disarmament uh, in the nuclear field. Let me remind you, Jay, that the first American president who spoke out about the importance of getting rid of nuclear weapons was one of your favorites, Ronald Reagan. But it's true, this was important in connection with uh, Barack Obama. He established the vision of a world without nuclear weapons. Very important. And I think on moral reasons, it is important to get rid of nuclear weapons. You cannot really expect the North Koreas and the Pakistans and the Indias of the world to refrain from having nuclear weapons when the superpowers will have them. And I think you can also make a very good case if you want to make a case in terms of realism of the benefit to the United States of getting rid of nuclear weapons. But it's not true that the Nobel Peace Prize is a pacifist prize. There are certain pacifists who have received the Nobel Peace Prize, particularly in the early years. There were quite a few. Uh, but many who are thought of as pacifists weren't really pacifists. I mean, take Nelson Mandela. For a certain period of time, he was the leader of the armed resistance of the ANC. He was not a pacifist. We've given the prize to two generals. General Marshall. I mean, Jay, you mentioned that there should have been a prize for the, what the U.S. did for Europe and the world during the Cold War. Yes, this was the prize to George Marshall. The Marshall Plan was a very important element, and it's been recognized. He was a general. And Yitzhak Rabin, who received the prize with Arafat Perez and Rabin then, in 1994. Of course, he was a general. And Shimon Peres has been dubbed the father of the Israeli atomic bomb. Like it or not. These are... And Arafat 
Of course, they had done many very questionable things. But they tried to resolve the most difficult of all international issues, the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, two peoples who both have such strong claims to the same territory. So it's just not true that uh, 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 virtually all who get the Nobel Peace Prize are pacifists. We know what the world looks like. For goodness sake, I mean, four American presidents, none of them were, were pacifists. I cannot really uh, deal with all the six points, which is in Jay's books and various articles. Let me just address one more. Jay thinks that the environmental prices are silly. An increasing number of scientists throughout the world agree that global warming does indeed exist. We have to address this issue. More and more scientists agree that the consequences are becoming increasingly important and dangerous. You have the best universities in the world here in America. And your leading scientists have all contributed to the reports of the IPCC, which is the scientific foundation for this. But you have rather big groups in America who just refuse to believe in modern science. They don't believe in evolution. They don't believe in global warming. That's their right. But the scientific evidence is pretty clear. And this is an important point of Alfred Nobel's will, because point one in the will is fraternity between nations. If saving the planet is not fraternity between nations, I don't know what fraternity between nations is. You can say silly. Unfortunately, that will not have any impact whatsoever on what is taking place out there in the real world. We have to address this. Thank you. Jay, Gear has uh, provided some exceptions to your rules. There's a long record available for anyone to examine of laureates, their lectures, and the presentation speeches given on December 10th by the committee chairman. And on this point of moral equivalence, you can read the lectures of Alva Myrdal, for example, or Dr. Laun and Chazov, a member of the Central Committee of the Soviet Union. Um, you can read uh, Joseph uh, Rotblot and the Pugwashers. You can look into Sean McBride, who won not only the Nobel Peace Prize, but the Peace Prize given by the Kremlin, the Lenin Peace Prize, which began life as the Stalin Peace Prize. Um, there is simply a, a long record. You, you can see what the Nobel chairman said about the so-called political rights in the democratic West, but the economic and social rights in the communist East. It's all there to read. And Gerd Lundestad knows this history better than I, I assure you. A couple of more points. Gorbachev, you mentioned. Yeah, I, I rather like what Lech Wałęsa told me. Why did Gorbachev win this Nobel Prize? Well, the way he put it was, and this is quite crude, but remember that Wałęsa is a labor leader and electrician, uh, not uh, something else, and he speaks bluntly. He said, Gorbachev had the instruments of rape and did not use them, as his predecessors had in Germany in 1953 and Hungary in 1956 and uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968 and so on. He let the people go. He could have crushed them. He put a toe in in the Baltic states and Lithuania. He could have crushed them as his predecessors had but like Pharaoh, for a time, he let the people go. And maybe that's worthy of a Nobel Prize. But he didn't win it in concert with 
Reagan. Let me just say that uh, Geyer Lundestad mentioned Reagan in a positive way, which is nice. You might not know that the Nobel Committee detested Reagan when he was president, when he was alive and kicking. And they told Oscar Arias privately when he won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 1980s, we're giving you this prize to use as a weapon against Reagan. And Arias told a, his, a historian, Robert Kagan, Reagan is responsible for my Peace Prize. I think Reagan was responsible for other Peace Prizes as well, and that George W. Bush was responsible for several Peace Prizes in a funny way. I think that Geyer mentioned my criticism of Mandela to you in order to shock you and to put a black hat on me, because Mandela, Mandela is obviously the most revered statesman on the planet. He's almost a, a, a Christ figure. And I think he might have left the impression that, that what I said had something to do with America. Uh, frankly, it was, and Mandela's a great man, of course, but like a lot of great men, uh, mixed. No one's perfect, right? No one's walking on water. What I singled out uh, was his defenses of uh, Gaddafi and Castro, very specifically, and his refusal to help their political prisoners. In fact, his bolstering uh, of them, the dictatorships. That's what I mentioned, in addition to everything else that's positive. So don't be so very shocked. Uh, when it comes to arms, I, I find myself saying, as I was in an argument about the, uh, the great reductions that are proposed in the US military, uh, if I had my way, there would be no military. Uh, there would be no guns and bullets and soldiers and bombs and fighter jets, no Pentagon. And for that matter, there wouldn't be police departments and locks on doors. Uh, I think that I, I take the world as, as, as it comes. And so I often think, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, as for the prize to Marshall in 1953, it's not like he won the prize for his work as chief of staff of the army. Uh, he won the prize for the Marshall Plan or the European Recovery Program, which he was the only one not to call it. He was such a modest man. He referred to it as the European Recovery Program. No one did this. And uh, I think that his, what he did in the defeat of Nazism was a great contribution to peace, but he did not win the prize for that in 1953. He won it for the Marshall Plan, well and good. And his Nobel lecture bears reading. It is one of, I would say, the three most unusual Nobel lectures in history. Uh, the first would be Theodore Roosevelt's. Uh, he said in a statement that shocked a lot of people, not in the lecture, but elsewhere in his memoirs, I think the greatest thing I ever did for peace was to send the American battle fleet around the world. And the next one was Marshall, and the next one was Mother Teresa, who used part of her address to speak about abortion. I think that must have shocked people. But Marshall stood before the good people in Oslo and talked about what a disaster demilitarization, demobilization, and disarmament had been for the United States and the democracies. He said, we were back on our heels before World War II, and then a quick demobilization after the war, unprepared for Korea, and people like me, he said, meaning Marshall, we have to send boys that have young men to their deaths. We ought to be prepared. And there is such a thing as peace through strength. I don't say uh, that the Nobel Committee has been a pacifist committee. Certainly not for a very long time. I do think there has been too little respect for the importance of mil military strength in keeping the peace. Now as for the environmental stuff, there, 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 there is a prize called the Goldman Prize, which is sometimes known as the Green Nobel or the Environmental Nobel. But if the Nobel is going to be that, be that there's, there's not much need for the Goldman, I suppose. And look, as I often say, the Nobel Peace Prize is this committee's to give. They can give it to whomever they want. We don't like it, we can form our own Peace Prize. I think there are more than 300 Peace Prizes in the world. The Nobel Peace Prize is the most famous. It's theirs to give in their judgment. Certainly, not everyone on the planet can agree with a committee of five Norwegians. Sometimes they don't agree with one another. There have been some 3-2 votes in history. Dr. Lungestad could tell you all about them. For example, the, the prize to President Wilson was very controversial, was done on a 3-2 vote. And um, who knows how the 2007 prize to uh, Al Gore and the 
Hi, Kay, you have a number three up. Does that mean three minutes? Oh, what a great technique, thank you. Um, who knows how that prize will look in the future? I, I didn't know, all of a sudden it was, okay. I'm like round three. I thought, um, who, knows how the, who knows how that prize will look? Uh, I think, I say in my book, I'm not as categorical as, as Geyer says that I am, but that, that's okay. Um, I think the prize may look foolish. I think it looked foolish after the revelation of those emails, all that politicking, all that maneuvering uh, at this university in, in Britain. And I'm really not sure that the Nobel Committee would have deigned to give the IPCC the prize after the revelation of all that. But, you know, if the science is so settled, if there's simply no, I just wonder why people like the head of the IPCC, this semi-laureate, I wonder why he won't debate people like the Danish environmental scientist Bjorn Lomborg. I wonder why he denounces Lomborg as a kind of Nazi, compares his own work, Lomborg's work, to what the Nazis did. That seems to me a person not very secure in his own views. And I think that um, it might help him in the eyes of some of his critics, some of the skeptics, to have an engagement on the issues the way we are today. And uh, are you about to hold up a number one? I think I'll quit now. Thank you, Kay. Jay, thank you very much. At this point, we want to turn over to questions from the audience, and I'm wondering if we have the cards ready yet, or all of you, have people had a chance to fill out their questions? I think he is coming. Uh, speak and you shall receive. Um, the first question we have from our Google Plus audience, and I think it really is only to you, Gear. It's a technical one, uh, but one which goes to the points that Jay was making, which is, what is the process of agreeing on a, on a laureate, and how long does it usually take? Okay, uh, I'm happy to address that. I try to make my answer uh, brief and to the point. You have to be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. And there are many, there are thousands and thousands who have the right to make a nomination. And the two large categories are any member of any government or parliament anywhere in the world, and university professors in certain subjects at any university anywhere in the world. And uh, the deadline for each year is February 1st. This is often misunderstood. We saw a very recent example just a few days ago because uh, I released the number of candidates for 2014, and that is 278. There are 278 candidates for the prize. And among these, uh, we don't release the list, but some of those who make the nomination, they release some names. So. Uh, President Putin's name has been mentioned. And it's, since this is already in the press, it's true that a member of the Russian parliament nominated President Putin. This, of course, does not mean that the committee has, uh, has approved of this choice. It simply means that we have received a letter from a person who has the right to make a nomination nominating President Putin. I was shocked to see, but it happens every year, so I shouldn't be shocked, that, uh, and of course on my email, when I get back home, there will be hundreds of emails stating, you idiots, what are you doing? Uh, it's very, very easy to be nominated for the prize. So we start with 278 this year. We've had our first meeting. The committee drew up its uh, first short list, 25, 30 candidates. Uh, I and my assistants, uh, we write reports on these uh, 25, 30, 35 names. At the next meeting in April, the number will be further reduced uh, to fewer than 10, and then we bring in the top international experts uh, who help us evaluate uh, these candidates in this very Norwegian-oriented uh, process. Norwegians are no better than anybody else. There are many things we know nothing about. Uh, so we did uh, 
we did bring in, we do bring in all these foreign experts. And if they're Americans, they ask about an honorarium, all the others, they will say yes automatically. Uh, so it's wonderful that all these professors out there in the world will uh, contribute to the process. So we spend most of the time, we have five, six, seven meetings in a year. So we go quickly from 278 down to 567, and then we spend most of the time evaluating these uh, top candidates. And we will be making the announcement of the outcome on October 10 of this year. And the award ceremony is always on December 12, uh, the date on which Alfred Nobel, Nobel died in 18... Uh, December 10th, uh, right? December 10, excuse me, sorry. December I 10. I don't want you to be late. Pardon? I don't want you to be late to the ceremony. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. There are some good points in your book, Jay. <laughs> I haven't heard a good point or two from you, dear. <laughs> December 10th, the date on which Alfred Nobel died in 1896. Steve, let me say a couple of things, if I may. Um, first, Gare, I, I'm an American, and I'm speaking here today without an honorarium, just, just so you know. Didn't even ask for one. Pardon? Didn't even ask for one. Um, second, there's some misunderstanding of the 2009 prize to Obama uh, that I've had. To, a lot of people think, well, he was sworn in on January 20th, and nominations are due by February 1st. Therefore, he won for a grand total of 10 or 11 days' work. Uh, this is not true. The prize is usually announced the second Friday of October, so that prize, you might say, had a nine-month gestation. He won for and uh, my my final point about this is that one shouldn't be too shocked by nominations. Anyone can be nominated by a qualified nominator. Uh, Hitler was nominated, so was Stalin. Almost everyone gets nominated. Thank you, Jay. Gear, could I could I ask you to be as open and frank as you can when you get down to the five or six? and you have this small group of Norwegians and you're having these distinguished people come in, how hard do you, the Norwegians, push these people as to why they're advising you one way or another? Or do you tend to be more passive with them? Well, I, I think uh, I am the permanent secretary of the committee. I am not a voting member. Uh, the, the, the five members vote. I do not vote. But I'm, in, I'm responsible for all the evaluations, uh, recommendations, and the, and the process. Uh, the normal, I mean, they, the members cannot be members of the government or members of parliament any longer. They tend to be ex-politicians. My point is that we should use the time available. Politicians want to be effective. They want to reach a decision quickly. And I say, no, no, no. We will be spending our time until October, and we will keep everything open until we have to make the announcement uh, in, in October. The normal situation will be that uh, out of the five members, three or four will support one candidate, or and one or two will support another candidate but they will have the majority candidate in second or third place. So they all agree that this is a good candidate, and you obviously then uh, go uh, with the majority candidate. Uh, of course, the, the one who loses out would most likely then be a strong candidate uh, next year as well. So if the minority, the, the, the problem arises if the minority thinks that the majority candidate is just awful, if you want to speak out against the choice, you have to leave the committee. And this has happened three times in our 113-year history. I mentioned the two who left the committee for the prize to Karl von Osiecki, probably the most successful, most important prize. Uh, there were two who dis disagreed with the prize to Kissinger and Le Docteau in 1973, which I guess proves that not all controversial prizes are successful. Uh, and then we had uh, one member who left the committee uh, because of the price to, well, he said Arafat, but it was really all three because he was a Likud man and he didn't like the other two either since they were Labour uh, Party people. Uh, I mean, that's an open um, if I, if account. If I can briefly follow up. I'm not sure that's a, a correct account, by the way, of why Cora Christensen left the committee. It's, I'm not sure that's I think man's not here to speak for himself, of course. He's dead. 
his son is living. I've spoken to. I'm not sure that's. I'm not sure that's a hundred percent true. I wonder what he would say in response to you. He would undoubtedly say that he left the committee because of other faults. Okay. Give uh, Jay with your permission. He founded the Friends of Israel group in the Storting in the Norwegian Parliament. He was a friend of that country, not merely of one party in that country. In fact, I don't think a Likud was a party at that point. It was part of what, what's called the um, was a coalition. Uh, Harut was the major party. Gear, could you share with us, if possible, in the conversations that go on? You mentioned that you know not not all of us are perfect. I think Jay agrees with that. We all have feet of clay, one way or the other. Jay pointed out a number of, of concerns he had on particular candidates. Do the discussions get to pros and cons about individuals? Do you probe if someone says, look, so-and-so is, is a great person, should get the prize, and somebody else says, ah, yes, but. For example, Mandela, someone says, look what Mandela's done uh, recently. And someone says, yes, but he was an advocate of violence as a young man. Do those kinds of things get brought up and talked about? Absolutely. I mean, as I described the process, we move very quickly from 278 or whatever down to fewer than 10. And then we spend many meetings on these few remaining candidates. And we will have many reports written on them. And in the mandate of these foreign experts, well, local experts as well, is to find anything that would, any argument uh, that would go against. So, so you have the equivalent of the Catholic Church's devil's advocate oh, in the consideration of sex. Absolutely. I mean, we go over all the counter arguments. And I can assure you, at least in my 25 years, I have never found a saint. I have never found a perfect candidate. We, have, we, we have, have all made mistakes, and we should be aware of what the mistakes have been for the, for the laureates. But of course, I mean, they are all human beings. Yes, they made mistakes. We are aware of the mistakes. Sometimes we even point out the mistakes in the chairman's presentation speech in the city hall. We reminded Kofi Anna of his two big mistakes, Bosnia and Rwanda. And we are entirely aware that Mandela was not a pacifist. No. Uh, so we have all these things. I know the Catholic Church has a different view on one of the candidates from earlier year, Mother Teresa. But my conclusion is that no, they are not saints. But they have had a vision and they have been courageous in trying to reach these very important goals. This is more important than their mistakes. We have two uh, very similar questions, one from, from Google Plus, again, one from the American College of Norway, and the other from Iowa. And let me start with you, Jay. The, the, the question goes to what motivates the two of you? Um, the question for you, Jay, is, is what, why did the Nobel Peace Prize come to your attention, and why did you feel it important um, to do your book? Nobel Peace Prize is a marvelous subject. It's one of the juiciest subjects around, I think. Um, it gives you a kind of snapshot or an overview of the 20th century. The Nobel Peace Prize is kind of a quick and easy way to look at the 20th century because so much comes into play where the Nobel Peace Prize is concerned. You have pacifism and progressivism, and you have World War I and the Depression and World War II and the Cold War and the so-called hot wars within the Cold War. Uh, Korea, Vietnam, Central America, Africa. Uh, you have the Middle East, uh, arms control, uh, environmentalism, uh, uh, the war on terror, the age of Obama. And so it, it's a neat way of looking at recent history. And plus, the, the characters are so interesting. The, the laureates, the life stories are so very interesting. And as I think I say in my book, there's not a dullard in the bunch. And a prize that goes to both Mother Teresa and Yasser Arafat is a very interesting prize indeed. And finally, a study of the prize really makes, if you're serious about it, makes you wrestle with some of the fundamental questions of war and peace and freedom and unfreedom and accommodation and absolutism, that sort of thing. You have to, as we say, the rubber meets the road. You have to decide what you think when you study the Nobel Peace Prize. And I must say, um, I'm a little uncomfortable here today at this forum because I seem to have been cast in the role or cast myself in the role of critic of the Nobel Peace Prize and attacker 
of the Nobel Peace Prize. And although this may make you laugh, uh, in my own circles, in conservative circles, I'm known as the big defender of the Nobel Peace Prize, the big apologist for it. They think it's a joke and a farce and not worth the time of day, and I, of course, don't. So I'm always Mr. Nobel in those circles. And to be here as kind of a black hat is a little bit weird. Uh, it's a tough you, role, Jay. Uh, we appreciate you taking on this role. Happy to be your foil anywhere. Gary, Gary, Gary the, uh, the, the similar question to you is, why did you choose to go to work for the Nobel Peace Prize, and why are you at it after 25 years with all the controversies that have come your way? Uh, I mean, Norway is a small country. We uh, constitute less than one-tenth of one percent of the world's population. Although, if you live in Norway, you tend to get a contrary uh, impression, but it's true. Uh, uh, Norway will not have major influence on many issues. There are a few. Uh, I was a professor of history at the world's northernmost university up in Tromsø for 16 years. I told you I come from the northern part. I had spent some years uh, in America, and uh, when you look at Norway from America, from abroad, and I thought, well, gee, this is probably the only job uh, that can make me leave the North, or that could make me have the courage to persuade my wife to move south in Norway with me. Uh, and it's fun! This is the most important thing. I mean, I get to travel almost wherever I want. I can meet almost anybody I want to meet. Uh, I can uh, go to, I can, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I still have time to do my academic research and write books. And then there was only one part uh, which I felt we didn't cover. So then I invented the Nobel Peace Prize concert. So now I get to meet also the big stars in Hollywood and the major <laughs> pop artists. It's fun. It's great fun. I applied for the job. Uh, it was advertised, and my uh, we will next week. Uh, my job will be advertised. Uh, I mean, for the successor, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed it. You should know that he's an extremely important man in Norway, a big celebrity. Everyone knows who he is. He has a lot of influence, and around the world, and people are very, very nice to Geir Lundestad, and they try to lobby because they figure he may be their ticket to the prize. And so I've, 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 I've enjoyed watching him from afar and now from uh, up close. He's a very big deal. So, 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 Jay, are your hopes for getting the prize higher or lower because of this relationship? <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of going for a secretary to the committee. Um, you know, there's no stipulation in, in Nobel's will that the committee members be Norwegian. It's strictly tradition. It's strictly custom. In fact, there was a great debate in the late 19, in the late 1890s and, and early 19 aughts, up until 1901, about the composition of the committee. Should it be international or should it be all Norwegian? But it's strictly custom. It's not will mandated, not that the committee necessarily follows the will anyway, which is, as we say in my family, a whole nother discussion. Jay, I have a question for you and then a comment from Gear. The question is, um, if you argue that there should be appreciation for the use of the military, in achieving and maintaining peace, what are the criteria you would use for giving a peace prize to the military? That cannot be done. Um, look, again, this concept of peace is so slippery, and the will has these three criteria. We call them criteria. Nobel himself didn't call them, call them that. This fraternity between nations and uh, abolition or reduction of standing armies and the holding of peace congresses. What I like is something that, Gary, could you help me with pronunciation? The old prime minister of Sweden, Hjalmar Branting, so in the ballpark. It's not right, but it's close enough. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1921. And he was looking back, because 1921 was so far into the future, you know, the, the will had been written in the mid-1890s. Mid, uh, uh, and he said those second two criteria, the abolition and reduction of standing armies and the, and the promotion of peace congresses, they might have reflected methods or techniques of their time. But the guiding principle, the lodestar, should be this fraternity between nations. Who has done the most or best work for the fraternity, for fraternity between nations during the preceding year? That's another term of the will that's often ignored, but again, that, that, that's a whole other 
uh, discussion. And so this is what the committee must decide. And I wouldn't myself wouldn't be too strict about the will, Steve. It's, I often say that arguments about Nobel's will they remind me a little bit about our, a little bit of arguments about the American Constitution. Some people are strict constructionists, want to want to interpret strictly or follow strictly. Others are more living document people, um, and they have a looser way of interpreting. And so it is with the will. I wouldn't want to be too strict because it would rule out human rights awards, freedom awards. You know, why should a freedom fighter get a peace prize? I think the first freedom award was to Chief Lutuli, the great South African leader in, in 1960, or for 1960. I think the award was made in, in 1961. But um, we all have a different idea of what keeps the peace. And I was raised in a quite, well, let me just say it, a left-wing environment. And uh, I grew up with that. We had on our wall a famous poster. People my age and older might know it. War is unhealthy for children and other living things. And my parents were very big on this. Everyone was. And it's certainly true to a degree. But when I grew up, I thought, huh, what was more unhealthy to little Anne Frank and her friends in the camps? War? Or the fact that liberating armies weren't reaching them in time? And over the years, as many of us have done, I changed my mind about things. Do you think you, if there were to be a crisis, if, if, let me give you a hypothetical, it makes no sense, but say a, a military leader, say David Petraeus is, is in your five or six, specifically for his role as, as the commander of the forces in Iraq trying to achieve stability. Could you see criteria? What criteria would come to your group's mind in, in evaluating um, the military side of the search for peace? Uh, this is a very difficult point. Um, I mean, I'm a professor of history. I have written many, many books about international relations, some of which are available <laughs> after the uh, session here. Uh, uh, there is um, an idealistic flavor to Alfred Nobel's will. I mean, after all, he does mention specifically as one of the three criteria the reduction of standing armies. And there are also certain other phrases in his will which clearly sees the prize in an idealistic perspective. Uh, you, can, you can make a good argument uh, that um, uh, force uh, is necessary uh, in some context. I think we all uh, would agree uh, we should have stood up to Hitler. Uh, force was absolutely necessary to stop uh, Hitler. But it is difficult, uh, and we have given the prize to two generals, as I said, Marshall and Rabin. So um, we are, every now and then... Neither, uh, it, neither, neither man was a general at the time, sir, just to remind you. But, but if you read, Ray, was Jay, you have, Minister of Israel. Jay, you have read all these speeches very closely. If you look again at the Marshall speech, you will see that they emphasize, to a surprising extent, his role as a general during World War II. Hombro does. True. That is true. Hombro was a different cat. Okay. Um, and uh, so the committee has uh, sometimes flirted with this, what I would call the realist argument, force. Um, the price to Theodore Roosevelt. Excuse, excuse me, Gear. I, um, he lived a few years Kissinger, before my time. Yeah. Uh, Kissinger, uh, what, 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 what had Roosevelt done in 19, was 1904, 1905, right? He immediately an end to the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, how many people actually, actually remember that there was a Russo-Japanese War, 1904, 1905, right? So That was ended with the Portsmouth Treaty. And may I quote to you what the New York Times editorialized? In 1905? They were outraged. I have this almost verbatim. The New York Times said, a curious smile must have illuminated the face of the globe when this yes. glittering prize for peace was given to the most warlike citizen of these United States. Yes, this is my argument when I said that we have been flirting uh, with the, the concept of, of realism, to put this uh, in simple terms. The prize to Theodore Roosevelt, 
for in, uh, negotiating an end to the Russian-Japanese war, and he was also uh, a great believer in arbitration. The prize to Henry Kissinger and Le Docteur, 1973, and you might even throw in, possibly, although I see it in a different light, Arafat, Peres, and Rabin. It is very confusing to give the same prize to Mother Teresa and to Yasser Arafat. And I think if we then really um, started giving out the prize to a, a series of leading military people, uh, this would uh, create endless uh, confusion. Uh, yeah. the, the Nobel Committee's line for many years has been there are many paths to peace. Yes. That I agree with. In fact, anyone would agree with that. The argument is over what constitutes peace. Two questions have come in. I'd like to put them together and um, address them to you both. One question is, what would you change about the Peace Prize and how it is awarded? And Jim, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, and then, in this context, are you dissatisfied by the concept of a Peace Prize or just the way it has been awarded? And if you could speak I, first, then I'll go to Gear, and then there's a question for you, Gear. Yeah. So if you could change I th things. I think there are three there. Okay, give me the first one again. I like them all. I'll be really brief on okay, each the, one. The, fir the first one is, what would you change about the Peace Prize, how it is awarded, the, and are you dissatisfied by the idea of a Peace Prize or the way it is awarded? <clears throat> the rules say you have to give a Nobel Prize, any of them, every five years. I don't think the Norwegian, I don't think the Peace Committee has skipped a year since 1972. We expect it to come every year, like Christmas or the 4th of July. It's just, or the Oscars. We want it every year. I'm not sure I'm opposed to skipping it now and then until an idea really gels and a, a, a truly um, appropriate winner emerges. That might be something I toy with. Also, I'd get back to this idea, I think, of fraternity between nations. And I wouldn't succumb, I wouldn't, I'd want to be extra careful not to succumb to the fashionable. Not to wake up and think, oh, what is the coolest, trendiest cause this year? What's making hearts flutter this year? Let's get the, put the Nobel Prize in that direction. I, I sort of admire some of the, if I may say this, more boring awards the committee has made. In fact, I think this most recent award to the group in The Hague. Is it The Hague or elsewhere in Belgium? The Hague. The Hague. I think it was kind of a gutsy award because the, the award to this heroic Pakistani teenager, Malala, I think would have been the most popular award in the history of the Nobel Peace Prize. And the committee said no and disappointed a lot of people. I sort of admired it, frankly. So I think some unsexy awards are just fine. And I, uh, look, I'm not a member of the committee and never will be, not just because I'm not Norwegian. Um, although Norway, by the way, now has a center-right government, which I think is very, very interesting. But um, as I keep saying, it's, it's their prize to give, and we argue about the meaning of peace. If I were a committee member, I would vote very differently. Uh, I think Reagan was at least des deserving of a peace prize as Gorbachev, uh, but the committee thought differently. As for whether the prize is worthwhile, I decided I had to, uh, an old friend of mine, semi-mentor, Norman Pod Horitz, the longtime editor of Commentary, said that in a piece of journalism, of opinion journalism, you have to pull the trigger. Let the reader know what you think one way or the other. It can be at the beginning, the middle, or the end, but pull the trigger. And I thought, I should probably say in this book, which uh, has a lot of facts and opinion too, and then an epilogue at the end, which is all opinion, uh, I decided I ought to say whether I think the Nobel Peace Prize is worthwhile, because people are going to ask me about it. And I was on one of my visits to Oslo, and I was in the Vigeland Sculpture Park. And outside the park, I met a, a street vendor selling a book, and I was buying a book for him. And because I had my reporter's hat on, I said, what do you think of the Nobel Peace Prize? And he first answered as a patriotic Norwegian. He said, well, it put Norway on the map. I like it for that. I don't agree with uh, every decision the committee makes, but I think on the whole, it's probably good to have a prize for peace. You have prizes in every other field, Nobel or not. Why not a prize for peace? And I agree, if peacemaking is a serious endeavor, I think a lot of so-called peacemaking is just that, so-called and frivolous and sometimes counterproductive. But if it is a serious endeavor, there might as well be an award or two or more for it. So I say yes. 
With your experience, Gear, if you were to change the Peace Prize, how would you change it? And in that context, the question is, what ideal person is in your mind who deserves a Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, there is no single person who would encapsulate all the ideals of the Nobel Peace Prize. No, no, no. Uh, I think the system has worked well, surprisingly well. Uh, but there are certain changes which uh, I should not uh, spell out to you now. Uh, I have still uh, about nine months left in my job. Uh, I should not uh, end uh, my career on a public note of criticism of the procedures of the prize, but I will be writing a couple of books after I retire and then I can give uh, much better answers uh, to your questions. But I do not see uh, huge changes. Let, let me, let, since some people understand, uh, misunderstand this, let, let me just say very bluntly, we do not claim a perfect record through these 113 years. No. It is very difficult to award a Nobel Peace Prize. There are hundreds of peace prizes out there in the world, and I look at what they do, and I see how easy it is to go wrong. And we have gone wrong. Need I mention Mahatma Gandhi? I mean, if there's one person who should have received the Nobel Peace Prize, it is Mahatma Gandhi. He never did. I mean, you cannot claim a perfect record when you missed on the most obvious candidate. I mean, the committee had more or less decided to give him the prize then in 1948. Then he was assassinated, but he could have been awarded the prize even posthumously, but the, the assassination was a huge complication. So uh, I, I don't have to say anything more. Uh, and when I, I write my book, I may possibly mention a few who did receive the prize who maybe shouldn't have. But the surprising thing uh, is that on the whole, I'm rather pleased with the results. Mistakes have been made. Mistakes will be made. I mean, my counterparts in the other committees, uh, the, the Nobel Prize is awarded in Sweden, I mean, they are kind of shocked when they, they hear me say this. We do not have a perfect record. No, of course we don't have a perfect record. Nobody has a perfect record. In, in medicine, the, they awarded the prize to the inventor of lobotomy. Need I say anything more? We, we only have a few minutes left, there, and there are a bunch of interesting questions, so my apologies to those of you who, whose questions will not be asked. But building on the, on the, on the previous question, foreign policy, you, you were emphasizing, Jay, I think in your remarks, the um, potential efficacy of military force. You were suggesting realism. But why not, under the criteria of building fraternal relations, foreign policy? Is there a way of elevating foreign policy and its skills in the Nobel Peace Prize? So for you, Jay, should foreign policy be singled out and elevated, and could it be? Well, uh, foreign policy is, uh, diplomacy is an essential part of geopolitics, right? and certainly of peacekeeping. But I remind you, I remind you of uh, Frederick the Great's old, uh, old chestnut, uh, diplomacy without arms is like music without instruments. Uh, it's very easy to be a so-called peace nation, as Norway is and has positioned itself, a peace nation, a globalist nation, a UN nation, an international organizations nation. Well, of course, they lived for all these years under the protection of, of the US military. Of course they can afford it. And uh, they weren't neutral. In fact, they're a member of NATO. They were an original member of NATO. Uh, they managed to avoid uh, invasion in the first war, avoid participation in that war. They very much wanted to do the same in the second. Understandably, they could not. Uh, they were ravaged, and they're an original member of NATO. They understand. But yet there's a lot of preening about peace, which is very easy to do when you have someone at your back. And very often in life, you need someone to stand up to a bully. 
That's true personally, it's true nationally, and it's true globally. Everyone loves the UN blue helmets. Whom does the world call, though, when the going really gets tough? This is a question I had to face as I was coming of age politically, and it's a question we all have to deal with. Here, on foreign policy is something more overtly uh, noticed by the committee. Good idea? Bad idea? I think the important elements are vision and courage. And of course, many of the Nobel Peace Prize laureates, they have had tremendous foreign policy skills. But I, I mean, if, if you refer to, should, should we honor academic experts or whatever? No, well, we, uh, in theory, uh, peace education, uh, yes, we do get uh, many nominations. Uh, uh, that, that could happen, that we will honor somebody in the field of peace education. Uh, could well happen. But I think, let, let, since Jay has uh, referred to this several times, let, let me take the discussion just very briefly about Gorbachev and Reagan and the end of the Cold War. I wrote the sentence myself, so I remember it vividly. Why did Gorbachev get the Nobel Peace Prize? Because he did more than anyone else to bring the Cold War to an end. We had given the prize to many who worked for changes within the Cold War framework, Willy Brandt, many others. Gorbachev ended the entire Cold War. He made the huge concessions. He did not use force on a major scale, which meant the liberation of Central and Eastern Europe. It, in the end, it, it resulted in the breakup uh, of his own uh, country. Reagan behaved very graciously towards Gorbachev. He, uh, he was very polite, so polite, in fact, that Nixon and, and Kissinger thought he went too far uh, in appeasing Gorbachev. No, 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 no. He did not appease Gorbachev. He cashed in on all the huge concessions Gorbachev made. Thank you, Reagan, for behaving so graciously to Gorbachev, but Gorbachev made all the key concessions. A final question, if I could, for both of you. Jay, let me start. A, a very different topic. Um, the West has criticized Muslims for not vigorously condemning and speaking out against terrorism and al-Qaeda. Should a Nobel Peace Prize be given to Muslim moderates who speak up against extremism in their own faith? Jay, and then Gear, last word. It would be very daring to be such a person, wouldn't it? Very, very daring indeed. Almost recklessly so. Uh, many of us have looked for a, a Middle Eastern Solzhenitsyn or Sakharov or Havel. They exist, at least budding ones. Many have been imprisoned and killed. I think the liberalization of the Middle East is something that ought to be boosted in every way possible. The Nobel Committee did its part in giving an award in part to a Yemeni heroine. That was very good. And uh, so, yes, and may I say this, Steve, if this is going to be my last word, I just want to say, since I've said some things that are so critical, often my friends and people on my general side corner me and say, name me one good thing the Nobel Peace Prize has ever done. And I could name many things. I could name 50 things off the top of my head. But I often say that Walesa or Wawensa told me personally that without the Nobel Peace Prize, his solidarity cause in Poland could not have succeeded. The way he put it was, there was no wind blowing into Poland's sail, and the receipt of the prize blew wind into our sail. That was a very, very good thing. And it's nice to hear warm words about Reagan now, so many years after his presidency. In 2009, when the Nobel chairman was giving his presentation speech for Obama, he actually had praise of Reagan. So times do change. Yeah. Yes, this is a crucial point. Uh, our dialogue um, with uh, Islam, 
um, and the Muslim countries. Uh, this is hugely important. Uh, and we have already addressed this. I mean, although I must confess, uh, largely indirectly, there are many Muslims who have received uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, Sadat, Arafat, uh, Yunus, <laughs> great man of religion. Yunus, uh, uh, Shirin Ebadi, Tavakol Karman. We want to, we want to honor those who um, want to change uh, certain uh, Islamic uh, Muslim countries uh, in ways which would be in line with the ideals of the uh, Nobel Committee. Uh, and of course all these, or most of them certainly, uh, represent alternatives to uh, uh, what could be a, a world dominated by, uh, by violence. Uh, so we, we, are, we are thinking very much about this. Dialogue is important uh, and dialogue with uh, Islam is crucial. Thank you, Jay and Gare, very much. Thank you all. And I think um, Maureen or Caitlin, you will close us out. Shall we? Gentlemen, all three, thank you very much for uh, illuminating us. You know, we knew that this peace thing was kind of controversial. Uh, now we find that peace awards are kind of controversial as well. And I would bet that there is not a person sitting here in this audience or joining us virtually that would not have heard something or many things that they agreed with and probably a few things that they disagreed with as well. So you have illuminated this for us and we are very appreciative of it. Uh, thank you so much much um, Steve Young for moderating this panel and uh, we are very pleased uh, Kate Anderson and I uh, to award uh, and give a gift to you Dr. Lundestad and to you Mr. Nordlinger in thanks uh, for your uh, contributions to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum 26 Nobel Peace Prize Forum. Thank you. Now, the gentlemen will um, enjoy themselves for just a minute or two longer while we talk about this networking break that is happening in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Please take the opportunity to turn to someone immediately around you whom you do not know and introduce yourselves and maybe share something about why uh, you are here and what you are looking forward to in the breakout periods. Quiz people as to what it is that makes them intellectually curious about these, this last session or about the breakouts that we are uh, coming into. Uh, as we finish uh, wrapping up here, uh, Mr. Nordlinger and Dr. Lundestad will be signing books uh, out in the lobby. Please feel free to uh, buy and and read things that will make you think long and hard about what you have heard already here this afternoon. I would mention too that there are a number of other books uh, by the Nobel laureates and by speakers here of the Nobel Peace Prize Forum uh, that are uh, available at the Orrin Gateway where Peace Coffee is also available uh, and where t-shirts and uh, other uh, things related to the Nobel Peace Prize are, are available for you. Um, every breakout session that you are going to be attending is within about a three to five minute walk of this very place. So uh, you may certainly be uh, on your own two feet if you wish to those breakout sessions. Uh, if you have uh, mobility issues, please use the bus service that is waiting for you right outside these doors. We are going to be returning to start the opening, uh, excuse me, the closing ceremony of this Nobel Peace Prize Forum at 4 o'clock. But as your breakout sessions wrap up at 3.30, make a beeline back here 
for a couple of reasons. First of all, you will want to get a great seat. Uh, her, um, uh, Ms. Lema Bowe, the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize winner, will be here with us. But more as importantly, we are very pleased that the Minnesota Boy Choir is going to be performing in the last few minutes of the breakout period. Uh, they are wonderful, and they will give us our own personal concert. So, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the breakouts. Enjoy uh, your time together with one another, and we will see you back here before 4 o'clock.